The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. The information and ideas presented on this show are for informational purposes only. Please consult a business continuity, security, or disaster recovery professional before implementing any plans or ideas discussed on this show. The implementation of any protocol is at the sole discretion and responsibility of our listeners. Is your business ready for a disaster, or are you prepared for anything? No matter the industry or structure of your organization, chances are there could be room for improvement regarding your survival business practices. This is Fear is Negotiable, Business Survival Skills 101. Your host is Pamela Hill. Join us today as we study what's working in business preparedness and what's still left to do. Here is Pamela Hill. Hello and welcome to the show, everyone. This is Pam Hill, your host, and this is Fears Negotiable Business Survival Skills 101. Well, it's sad to admit, but acts of mass violence have become an almost weekly occurrence in the U.S. As the battle to implement stricter gun laws rages on, law enforcement, the judicial system, and mental health professionals alike are struggling to find ways to curb this epidemic. One important option is to evaluate the way in which offenders and people with mental illness are assessed for their level of violence risk. And lucky for us, our guest today is an expert in the field of violence risk assessment. Jay Singh, PhD, is the internationally award-winning president and CEO of the Global Institute of Forensic Research. He is a former senior clinical researcher in forensic psychiatry and psychology for the Department of Justice in Switzerland and fellow of the Mental Health Law and Policy Department at the University of South Florida. He completed his graduate studies in psychiatry at the University of Oxford. Since that time, he's lectured for Harvard, Yale, Cornell, among many, many others. Dr. Singh's primary research interest is forensic risk assessment, the attempt to predict the likelihood of future violence in order to identify those at greatest need of intervention. So welcome to the show, Dr. Singh. Thank you so much for having me, Pam. Yeah, it took us a while to get it organized, but now I'm really glad that we did. Um, Oh, me too. (laughs) And you're back in the U.S. as well, so that makes it a little easier. Um, So I'd like to start with just kind of some of the basics and maybe start by talking about how our understanding of mental illness itself has changed over the years. Sure, Pam. This is a field of knowledge that's really grown considerably over the centuries and decidedly so in the past several decades. You know, if you and I got into a time machine and transported ourselves back, let's say, 100 years, we would be in a completely different place when it comes to our understanding of mental illness. We'd be in a world where schizophrenia is caused by mothers not caring enough about their children, where homosexuality is a severe mental illness, and where a repression of something like sexual urges could be seen as a potential cause of something like lifelong paralysis. And if we went even further back, we would see evidence of mental illness as a manifestation of evil spirits needing to be purged from the body. But over the last century or so, our understanding of mental illness has really developed from one mostly based on theory and conjecture to one based on high-quality empirical research combined with a truly unprecedented understanding of the brain today, so long story short, we now understand much more than we have in the past. Now, what about the treatment options? Have those changed and, and evolved as the more you know, information we have? Sure. So the human experience itself uh, can be thought of as being divided into three different but related elements, and these are feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. Uh, and the focus in psychotherapy has evolved pretty much in this same order, first focusing on feelings, then focusing on behaviors, and finally focusing on thoughts. Now, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of different treatments out there, sometimes even for the same mental illness, uh, but most fall into a derivation of one of four uh, types of treatment, four types of clinical therapy. Uh, Generally, these are called psychoanalytic, behavioral, or cognitive therapy. Uh, To be able to elaborate a, a bit on this, so the psychoanalytic, some people these days call this the psychodynamic model. This focuses on a patient's feelings. Uh, The therapist is supposed to be a so-called blank slate 
uh, rarely revealing any emotion or any personal information about him or herself, and thus allowing them to act as a, a sort of guide to the patient as he or she talks about whatever is on his or her mind. And as this therapist listens, uh, their goal is to direct the thoughts of the patient to help him or her explore more deeply and hopefully identify some deep-seated emotions uh, from the present as well as from their own past. Uh, the issue with this model, some felt and uh, many still feel, is that let's say, Pam, you were my patient and I'm your therapist. Uh, I can interpret some of your feelings in one way, but let's say then you want a second opinion, you go to the doctor down the hall, they could have an entirely different interpretation of the exact same things that you tell them. So it, it was and it continues to be quite hard sometimes to measure a lot of aspects of psychoanalysis, despite this form of treatment uh, frequently lasting many, many years as opposed to weeks or months. Uh, and this is often seen as uh, just unacceptable to researchers and clinicians uh, who are seeking evidence-based treatment approaches to treating problems uh, in a very timely fashion, very efficiently. And so because of that, a lot of people started turning to an alternative approach uh, that's known generally as uh, behavioral therapy. And the idea here, the focus, is on measurable behavior instead of these feelings. Uh, so, for example, a patient's feeling about his father may be difficult to quantify, but say the number of times that he calls his father, uh, whether or not he sends him a birthday card, and whether he says the words, uh, I love you, for instance, during interactions with him, these could all be very important and measurable indicators of the quality of their relationship. And so in behavioral therapy, the mind is oftentimes treated as a black box, with the emphasis being more on these measurable actions. Uh, to give you an example of this, I used to work uh, at a hospital called McLean Hospital in their Obsessive Compulsive Disorders Unit. This was up in Massachusetts. Uh, and in this unit, OCD was treated using a form of behavioral therapy. And what we would do is that we would expose patients uh, to the thing that made them anxious and then prevent them from engaging whatever their usual ritualistic compulsions were. So, for example, if a patient believed that, uh, let's say, she didn't clap three times before entering every room, that her mother would die. And if that was the case, then we would walk into different rooms with her, but not allow her to clap her hands. And understandably, you know, the anxiety would go up quite high. Uh, but we would stay with her, ask her to stay with the anxiety until it naturally went away. And by doing this time and again, eventually her clapping behavior would cease, and so would the anxiety walking through doors. So the, the focus was really on the behavior here. Uh, but a lot of people felt that this focus on behavior was really missing out on the things that were going on inside of uh, this concept of the mind. And so as the decades drew on, uh, arguably the latest approach that's considered really a main approach to treatment uh, is called cognitive therapy. And you'll often hear about a combination of behavioral therapy and cognitive therapy uh, that's referred to as CBT. Now, whereas, cognitive, whereas uh, psychoanalytic therapy, for instance, focused on feelings, behavioral theory focused on behaviors, Cognitive theory focuses on thoughts. So imagine, Pam, you walk into my office one day and your boss very sternly asks you uh, to see you in his office. And all of a sudden you get really nauseous, you get really anxious. And that nausea, that's a really intense reaction to someone simply asking you to go into a room. So the big question we ask ourselves is, so why do you feel that way? You know, your boss obviously isn't going to physically harm you. Uh, but oftentimes without us recognizing it, we have a series of so-called automatic thoughts that get triggered. So, for example, we think, oh, my gosh, he called me into his office. That means he's going to fire me. Last time I had a performance evaluation, I came across so poorly. And these thoughts are what make you anxious, not being asked to enter the room, per se. And therefore, cognitive therapy really tries to assist you or assist the patient in reframing his or her thoughts to be able to perceive the exact same situation differently. It's almost like downloading a new kind of software onto your computer. So, for example, uh, a different kind of operating system so that you see the same things but just differently. And all three of these forms of therapy do have uh, some kind of an empirical basis, some more than others, arguably. Uh, but the key is that when it comes to seeking treatment is to really explore all of the options that you have available to you and to pick the one that you feel best fits with your own personal belief system, and with your personality, because that's what's really going to give you the best shot at a healthy recovery. 
Well, really, really interesting um, to see kind of how they're not only understanding of the illness itself, but also that the treatment options are seeming to, you know, to be to caught up, which is honestly kind of surprising considering how much money has been taken out of the mental health care budget across the United States. Uh, you'd think that uh, research and everything else would have been just completely come to a standstill um, with all sure. the budget cuts. Um, can all mental illness be treated with drugs or counseling? All types. That's a great question. I think that this is definitely one that uh, people get concerned about sometimes. Uh, there are certain classes of mental illnesses, uh, for example, personality disorders, which some people have probably heard of, uh, where treatments are fewer and further between than other classes of disorders, things like mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders. If we take a look at something, it's called the DSM-5. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The most recent version was released in 2013, so it's quite a recent uh, adaptation. This is, uh, to put it in layman's terms, the the big book of mental illness diagnoses. That's what we're looking at here. Uh, The way you make a diagnosis diagnosis here is you take a look at a bunch of different pieces of information and try to make a diagnosis consisting of several different so-called axes. Now, axis one disorders, as we call them, these are the things that you're typically going to hear about. Uh, For example, if you listen to radio or watch television, go to movies, you'll hear about things like psychotic disorders, mood disorders and anxiety disorders, somatoform disorders, so on and so forth. But something that you uh, less frequently hear about is Axis 2. And Axis 2, we have really lifelong disorders. Uh, mental retardation is on this, as well as this uh, class of disorders that we refer to as a personality disorder. And this is basically a rigid, maladaptive pattern of thinking and behavior that persists throughout one's life into adulthood. And so what we're dealing with here is really someone's personality, not their response to some life event per se. So take, for example, uh, there's a disorder called schizoid personality disorder, uh, which is characterized by a lack of interest in social relationships and resulting self-isolation. So if one could try to use different kinds of drugs or counseling per se, but that person just doesn't feel the need to socialize and it doesn't bother them. It's not that something occurred in their life that's making them self-isolate. This is simply their personality. Uh, There's another diagnosis that's in this DSM-5, which is mental retardation. And, of course, uh, there's no magic drug or psychotherapy per se to be able to treat a disorder like this. It's more something where, through time, we can help to manage uh, different symptoms, but to, uh, to say that we can make drastic improvements here is something that we should be a little bit cautious about, I think. Yeah, that, that seems like, plus it seems like we're still, the, like, even we're in the learning curve, you know, still trying to figure out really what all of these various things are. Um, so Absolutely. that's got to, you know, kind of tie your high. All I know is I need a copy of that book for my family because <laughs> I'm sure I could go to town on my family. <laughs> um, terrible, Dr. Terrible. Singh. <laughs> I know, I'm just joking. Uh, we have to go to break now, but when we come back, I want to talk about um, Uh, people with mental illness and whether or not they're more likely to commit violence. I think that's a really important question, certainly salient to our conversation today. So this is Pam Hill. I'm here with Dr. Jay Singh, and we'll be right back. We're always talking business. Talk to an expert. Call now, toll free, 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Voice America Business Network. From disasters to cyber threats, it's hard to keep up with the myriad of risks facing businesses today. Risk Partners Alliance is a consortium of business and technology consultants whose focus is to identify and mitigate threats to the operation of your business, your critical systems, infrastructure, and information security. We create comprehensive business continuity programs, including risk assessment, emergency preparedness, crisis management planning, technical disaster recovery, and information security services. We provide hands-on crisis leadership team evaluation and training through scenario-based practices. Our experts are widely sought-after speakers because of their passion, excellence, and unique training methods. 
and have a 30-year track record of providing risk management and recovery services to a variety of industries. Our proven plans have been put into action in every major disaster since 1989. Find us online at riskpa.com or email info at riskpa.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Fear is Negotiable. You deserve some rest from worry. Contact us so we can help. Follow us on Twitter at VoiceAmericaTRN. Get the lowdown on guests, new shows, and your favorites. That's VoiceAmericaTRN. The business community's first choice in Internet talk radio, Voice America Business Network. You are tuned in to Fear is Negotiable, Business Survival Skills 101. If you have a question or comment about the program, please send us an email to info at riskpa.com. Again, that's info at riskpa.com. Or follow us on Twitter at Fear is Negotiable. Now, back to the program. Hey, welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Pam Hill, and I'm here with Dr. Jay Singh, and we are talking about mental illness and um, okay, so I have two twenty-four thousand dollars questions for you this uh, in this segment, Doctor Sang. The first is: Can all mental illness be treated, or I'm sorry, can mental illness be cured, or really just kept in check? Be warned, Pam, and, and invoice is coming your way. I have a feeling after, uh, <laughs> after the show. God dang it! <laughs> well, what I would say is that sometimes what I tell my students is that all of us really has every mental illness. All of us sometimes feel really down, so depressed. All of us feel sometimes really anxious. Uh, all of us now and again feel something like invincible, or perhaps we're more important than we necessarily are in the world, uh, so maybe a little bit delusional. Uh, but it's important to know that as mental health professionals, our goal is not to necessarily label and pathologize people, and quite on the contrary. Uh, we only diagnose a major mental illness, something like a major depression or a generalized anxiety uh, or a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, when there's evidence of three things. Uh, the first is evidence that the symptoms that you're experiencing interfere somehow with your ability to become educated. Second, with your ability to get a job or to do a job. And the third is evidence that these symptoms interfere with your ability to uh, effectively socialize with others. So if you don't have a problem with any of those things, then making a diagnosis would, would likely be quite inappropriate. So in other words, our aim is to make a diagnosis uh, to be able to help patients get back on their feet and really live happy, healthy, and productive lives. A mental illness is just really can be thought of as an extreme form of an ordinary thought, emotion, or behavior that we all have to some extent. So being, quote, cured is not so much as the goal and so much as to be able to eliminate uh, that element of extremity that interferes with your life. So I would say that at the end of the day, the goal is not so much to be cured so much as it is to be able to keep uh, these signs and symptoms in check. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I like that. I, I'm going to write that down and then tell everybody that I, if I'm having <laughs> mental illness, it's the Dr. Singh told me it was okay. <laughs> um, now, here's the other big question. Are people with mental illness more likely to commit acts of violence? Absolutely. This is the $24,000 question, probably $24 million question right now. Uh, it's really a hot button issue, Pam. There's no question. Uh, to tackle it, let, let me start out by reading you a quote, Pam. This is from a nationally representative survey of the public image of mental illness by Americans. So this is the quote. It's mental illness is a very threatening, fearful thing and not an idea to be entertained lightly about anyone. Emotionally, it represents to people a loss of what they consider to be the distinctively human qualities of rationality and free will. And there is a kind of horror in this dehumanization. As both our data and other studies make clear, mental illness is something that people want to keep as far from themselves as possible. So, Pam, reading that quote, when do you think that that was published? Um, within the last few years. Exactly, right? So this was published in 1955. Wow. The scary part is that it's probably just as relevant today as it was 70 years ago, uh, despite quite a bit of money being put into educational efforts concerning mental illness. Uh, but the big question here, I think, you know, we as a community, is uh, whether this fear, so this stigma 
of dangerousness is really justified. And I know that a lot of people are worried about this. Uh, so maybe, maybe let's chat a little bit about, about the numbers, you know, what we know from research, I think. Um, so number one, are individuals diagnosed with a mental illness more likely to commit acts of violence than individuals without a mental illness? Uh, the answer is yes. Statistically, the annual incidence of violent crime in people with a severe mental illness is uh, on average about four times higher than the general population. And yes, it's also true that across research studies, we do see the mental illness is a consistent but modest risk factor for violence. Uh, but here are four things that you're going to hear a lot less frequently, but I think are, are really just as important. Uh, the first is that risk factors like uh, having committed a violent crime in the past, something like substance use or being unemployed, these are far more consistent and powerful predictors of violence than mental illness is. Also, number two, there's really no clear evidence we have. We've tried to find it, but we can't find it, that mental illness actually causes violence. And I think all of us had that one uh, math teacher back in the day who loved telling us that correlation is not causation. And, and that really is the, the lesson to learn here. Yeah. Uh, the third, this is the big number that always gets me, Pam, is that if we took everyone diagnosed with a mental illness and just took them out of the equation completely, we would still see between 95 to 97% of all violent crime that we currently see in the United States. And this means that the vast majority of individuals diagnosed with a mental illness are never violent and that we're spending a great deal of time debating mental illness and violence when in actuality, if we spent that time and money addressing poverty, unemployment, gangs, neighborhood needs, some more preventative efforts, we could be much more effective in terms of uh, having a strategy to reduce rates of violence. And finally, we always forget that individuals diagnosed with a mental illness are twice as likely than their neighbors to be victims of crimes than they are to be perpetrators. But for every one research study even that's published on the topic of being a victim, if you're diagnosed with a mental illness, we see between three to six studies on being a perpetrator. So even if we go outside of something like the media, let's say, and going to academia, we still see this bias of focusing on predicting violence in the mentally ill as opposed to seeing whether we can prevent violence against this population. Wow. It just makes you wonder, is it because it's more sort of sexy and salacious to talk about, um, you know, to put on the news and, and you know, all of that and why all of this effort is being put towards that? that I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that's very, very important, um, how much more likely they are to actually be abused, um, you know, when they're out by themselves and, and uh, isolated. So that's really important. Um, so what about different types of mental illness diagnoses? Are there certain types that are more likely to commit violence. So schizophrenia, bipolar, um, you know, kind of the ones that we all hear about, um, you know, every day. There, I don't even know if there have been any studies done on that. Sure. So I, what I would say is that probably the diagnosis that's been pushed to the front and center these days, given the very tragic incidents uh, that occurred at Sandy Hook Elementary, as well as now uh, in the UC Santa Barbara area is Asperger's syndrome. This was really pushed to the front and center of this discussion on mental illness and violence recently. Uh, so I would say that well, why don't we talk a little bit about Asperger's syndrome and how this kind of a diagnosis could inform uh, predicting violence. Uh, Asperger's syndrome itself, this is a high-functioning form of autism that's characterized by having difficulties in social functioning uh, as well as issues with nonverbal behavior. So you'll routinely see these individuals, uh, for example, exhibiting repetitive behaviors and having some pretty intense interests, uh, hobbies, for example. And the diagnosis, a lot of people don't know, was actually eliminated from the DSM's most recent version, which was published in 2013. But the label really remains part of the day-to-day -day lexicon, uh, particularly here in the States. And unlike disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, though, which we just mentioned, Research has suggested that individuals with this diagnosis, they're not at an elevated risk of violence compared to the general population. Even if you take the one, the diagnoses that are, let, let's use a practical example. So in the United States, there's about 11,000 people every single year who uh, are killed by gun violence. Let's take guns, for example. Um, if we take a look at the lifetime prevalence of, let's say, a, a given woman uh, committing homicide uh, using a gun in the United States, 
what we would end up seeing is that really we're talking about not just a fraction of a percentage, we're talking about four zeros after the decimal point here in terms of probabilities. So what we find is that, yes, there is a statistically significant increase in violence risk when it comes to women who have schizophrenia. Some people have even quoted this as being as high as 15 to 20 times higher women with schizophrenia versus without. So if that's all I knew, Pam, if that's all that I heard, I would say, wow, I, I kind of have to be worried now. I, I have to be careful. If there's a woman or someone in my family who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, I would be a bit worried. But the thing is that practically speaking, let's multiply that extremely small percentage by 20, and we're still dealing with a 99.999% likelihood that, that that is never going to happen. So just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean that it's practically significant. And this is an issue that we so rarely talk about because, as you said, it's a lot sexier to be able to instead talk about how we need to be, be afraid uh, when in actuality this, this really isn't the case. Uh, the natural question I see, though, when we're dealing with something like, like a Sandy Hook or uh, like an Elliot Rogers, a UCSB, uh, and what's difficult to speculate on is uh, when it comes to individuals with a diagnosis like Asperger's, where we don't see that statistically significant increase, uh, is that about 80% of individuals who do commit a violent act who are somewhere on the autism spectrum, they have what's called a comorbid diagnosis at the time of their crime. In other words, they have something else in addition to a diagnosis of Asperger's. And it could be the signs and symptoms of these other disorders that they have a role to play. Uh, but keep in mind, there's no causal relationship to our knowledge between mental illness and violence. And the motivation behind this kind of violence, mass violence, uh, is very different for individuals with something like Asperger's syndrome, we found. It's truly a method of communication. Uh, it's the attempt to communicate that you yourself are very offended and that you want these offenses against you to be recognized on a larger scale. So when it comes to predicting violence, uh, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of instruments that are available to practitioners who are interested in looking at risk in psychiatric populations. Uh, if you'd like, I'm, I'm happy to chat a little bit more about risk assessment. Well, let's do that in the next segment. We actually have to go to uh, break by right now, but when we come back, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So this is Pam Hill. Uh, this is Fears Negotiable, and we'll be right back. We're always talking business. Talk to an expert. Call now. Toll free. 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Voice America Business Network. From disasters to cyber threats, it's hard to keep up with the myriad of risks facing businesses today. Risk Partners Alliance is a consortium of business and technology consultants whose focus is to identify and mitigate threats to the operation of your business, your critical systems, infrastructure, and information security. We create comprehensive business continuity programs, including risk assessment, emergency preparedness, crisis management planning, technical disaster recovery, and information security services. We provide hands-on crisis leadership team evaluation and training through scenario-based practices. Our experts are widely sought-after speakers because of their passion, excellence, and unique training methods and have a 30-year track record of providing risk management and recovery services to a variety of industries. Our proven plans have been put into action in every major disaster since 1989. Find us online at riskpa.com or email info at riskpa.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Fear is Negotiable. You deserve some rest from worry. Contact us so we can help. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. Voice America Business Network. The bottom line in business. You are tuned in to Fear is Negotiable, Business Survival Skills 101. If you have a question or comment about the program, please send us an email to info at riskpa.com. 
Again, that's info at riskpa.com or follow us on Twitter at Fear is Negotiable. Now back to the program. Hey, welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Pam Hill, and I'm here with Dr. Singh, and we're talking about mental illness. And right now, we're going to start talking about the process of risk assessment. I mentioned earlier when I was introducing you, kind of gave a really quick blurb on what a violence risk assessment was. Could you first define that for us and then just talk about the process? I mean, how do you actually accomplish this? Absolutely. So violence risk assessment is the attempt to predict the likelihood uh, of future violence in order to be able to prevent it. Uh, The goal here is to be able to identify people who are at higher risk so that we can then put treatment or some people call the risk management strategies in place to be able to lessen that likelihood that we end up finding. This is really the goal here. Um, There are kind of three broad Uh, approaches to risk assessment, I would say. Uh, The first is what's referred to as unstructured clinical judgment. The idea here is that I bring somebody into my my office, sit down with them, uh, do a clinical interview with them, take a look at some of their files, and then I use my knowledge of this specific client in their case as well as my clinical experience uh, upon seeing other patients, doing readings, etc., to be able to make a call as to whether or not someone is likely to be violent or not. So even though we use this term unstructured, certainly no one's claiming that clinicians are flipping coins or any such thing. Uh, It's simply that they're not using a structured evaluation method that's been validated uh, to be able to conduct the evaluations. Now, we know from all the way back in 1981, uh, based on reviews of the literature, that this form of assessment, unstructured clinical judgment, is really only accurate in one out of every three cases. So at the end of the day, for every three clients whose risk I assess in this manner, the likelihood is high that I'm going to be incorrect in two of these. And surprisingly, what we found over the years in the research literature is that the more confident I am in my unstructured judgment, the more likely I am to be incorrect. So if you see someone on the stand, for example, in a court setting who is extremely well-spoken and extremely confident, uh, but simply does not have an empirical basis underlying their assessment, uh, they're just as, if not more likely to be incorrect in their evaluation. But then people started saying, there must be something we can do about this. And a lot of people attributed this lack of accuracy to this inherently subjective process uh, that may differ from client to client. And so because of that, what we decided to do was to structure things in a much more objective and transparent way. And this is what gave way to an approach called actuarial assessment. Now, if you think about uh, the word actuarial, I always think about insurance. So, for example, if I own a red car, my premium is going to go up. Uh, If I'm a guy, my premium is going to go up. If I have a history of accidents, my premium is going to go up. It's the same idea when it comes to violence risk assessment. If I have a previous conviction, my risk is going to go up. If I'm male, my risk is going to go up. If I have a diagnosis of substance use, my risk is going to go up. So it's really done using a mathematical algorithm as opposed to a clinician playing an active role here. Now, of course, there's some clinical judgment. For example, just deciding which tool to use in the first place requires clinical discretion. Deciding how to fill out the form requires clinical discretion. But it's really the risk and protective factors that are included on, it looks like a checklist, on one of these checklists that makes the call at the end of the day of how likely... Uh, a group of individual is to be able to go and commit a violent crime. And this is very different than the third approach, which was an attempt to bring clinical judgment back into the picture somehow. I have a buddy of mine who's uh, a practitioner in London, and he told me a story once about how he had uh, a very nice middle-aged woman who came into his uh, psychiatric unit, a locked unit. And what happened one day was that uh, she attacked a staff member. And so he asked, he, he said, you know, what, what happened? What was so different about her on that day? And his staff members all told him, well, she was wearing this red cardigan. And as the months went on, they realized that she was the nicest woman unless she was wearing that red cardigan. And she just went on, she would attack staff, uh, throw chairs, uh, all sorts of things. And so eventually they decided, well, we're just going to take the cardigan away. 
But when they took it away, they genuinely had no idea when she was going to be violent. So they ended up giving it a back to them. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> that's empirical but data. That's <laughs> it's crazy, right? But it's one of these things where at the end of the day, some of these risk or protective factors are so unique to the specific case that you're dealing with that it's simply not feasible to assume that some kind of a statistical algorithm is going to pick up on them. They're just too unique to the individual. And so because of that, a group of clinicians and researchers got together and said, we need to put some kind of clinical discretion back into this process, but we don't need to do it in a way where we're only relying on clinical judgment. So this new approach is what's referred to as the structured professional judgment or the SPJ approach. And the idea here is that you use evidence-based risk and protective factors and the same kind of a checklist you would see for these actuarial, more mathematical tools. But at the end, instead of getting a total score and letting the tool decide for you where this individual lies on the spectrum of risk, you use your clinical discretion to be able to assign some sort of a category to this individual, for example, being at low, moderate, or high risk. So these are the tools that we have available to us. Like I mentioned, there's over 400 of them that are available right now, so there's really quite a few. And there's an average of about 200 studies on these instruments published every single month. I'm oh, sorry, every single year, uh, about 15 to 20 published every month. So this is really a literature that's exploding right now, and it certainly is important to be able to talk about and understand the nuances of just how good are we at predicting violence. Right, absolutely. Now, how far out in time can these assessments predict? This? So if I you know, assess somebody in June, um, is this completely outdated by July, or do, do things really change so slowly that, um, that we can predict it farther out in time? Sure. This, this is a big question that's been asked over the past two decades. And the reason that I say the past two decades is that uh, when actuarial tools were, which are still very commonly used in practice, when they were in their heyday, though, uh, so kind of in the 90s, uh, really most of these commonly used actuarial tools, they do not predict risk in the short term. They don't do days, weeks, months, even years. Uh, they do either 5, 10, 15 years, 7 to 10 years, it's really very far out in the future that they're predicting. So recently, there's been more of a, more of a movement specifically with these uh, SPJ professional judgment tools to shift the focus a bit into maybe more clinically meaningful time periods of very short term. So some of them are built literally for a day or for hours. Most of them, though, are weeks or up to, let's say, three months at a time. And because the content, the actual risk and protective factors that make up these tools on these new tools, they're what's called dynamic factors. These are just things that can change over time. So, for example, I can't do anything about someone who has a history of substance use, but I can definitely do something about someone who currently has a diagnosis of substance use. And so this is the difference here. And the newer tools tend to have these more changeable factors, which some have argued are more useful for treatment planning purposes. And those are the ones typically that also focus on a shorter time frame. Now, when will you really do these? Do you get called in? You know, do, does a clinician get called in because somebody's in the hospital or because somebody is arrested? How, do, how does this even get started? Sure. So both in mental health and correctional systems, there's really numerous points of contact where a risk assessment might be appropriate. Uh, everything from police initially coming on to a scene of domestic violence, let's say, where they take the gentleman outside if it's a male perpetrator and have to make the simple decision of, listen, I've already got somebody in the back of my police car. Can I put this guy in back with the other fellow, or do I need to get him his own car to, let's say, something like uh, bail? Is this guy safe enough to actually put him back in the community, or should I keep him uh, in a jail setting? Uh, to length of sentencing, how long should I keep this gentleman or this lady in uh, this kind of a setting, so incarcerated? Uh, when they are incarcerated, what level of service should they receive? Uh, of course, something like a discharge or a release decision. And then once they are released, what are the conditions of the, their release? Uh, so, for example, should we have some kind of community supervision, some sort of mandated treatment that they need to uh, take part in? So these are really all places where risk assessment would be used. 
Okay. Well, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we only have a couple minutes before we go to break. So um, I would like to at least start the question, are, are we really good at predicting violence? I mean, can do these things work in the sure. overall? This is the big question, I would say. And, uh, you know, if we compare how good we are, so we mentioned just a moment ago that when it comes to unstructured clinical judgment, that we're only correct really around one out of every three times from this review in 1981. So after that, this is really when this explosion of different tools began. Now, the big question is, how do these tools actually perform? And even though there are a lot of studies on this. You can almost think about every single study on accuracy as being like a tree in the forest. And every now and again, the forest gets so large that you really need to take a step back. And instead of looking at each of these individual studies, you need to somehow combine them and see overall, how are we doing? And this process is what's called a meta-analysis. So it's an analysis of other analyses. And so in 2012, one of the largest meta-analyses on the accuracy of these tools was published in a journal called the British Medical Journal. Uh, It included over 100 different samples from uh, many different countries around the world. And what they found was that when they took the most commonly used risk assessment tools for each of these three purposes, for violence risk assessment, sex offender risk assessment, and general recidivism risk assessment, and they took a look at how they performed, what they found was that on average, Uh, Of those individuals who are judged to be at high risk of future violence, only about 40% actually go on to commit uh, future act of violence. However, about 90% of individuals who are judged to be at low risk do not. So we're actually very accurate at identifying individuals who will not go on to commit a future violent act, but we're maybe not so great at being able to identify high-risk people. In other words, How the interesting. Yes, overestimating wow. the likelihood of violence. Now I can see why you've done all this research on this because I've read, uh, you know, quite a few of your papers and it's uh, you, you talk about this stuff. This is very, very interesting um, stuff. So we've got to go to break now. Um, and when we kind of come back, we're going to just keep kind of on the, the vein that we're on right now. So this is Pam Hill. I'm here with Dr. Jay Singh and we'll be right back. We're always talking business. Talk to an expert. Call now. Toll free. 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Voice America Business Network. From disasters to cyber threats, it's hard to keep up with the myriad of risks facing businesses today. Risk Partners Alliance is a consortium of business and technology consultants whose focus is to identify and mitigate threats to the operation of your business, your critical systems, infrastructure, and information security. We create comprehensive business continuity programs, including risk assessment, emergency preparedness, crisis management planning, technical disaster recovery, and information security services. We provide hands-on crisis leadership team evaluation and training through scenario-based practices. Our experts are widely sought-after speakers because of their passion, excellence, and unique training methods and have a 30-year track record of providing risk management and recovery services to a variety of industries. Our proven plans have been put into action in every major disaster since 1989. Find us online at riskpa.com or email info at riskpa.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Fear is Negotiable. You deserve some rest from worry. Contact us so we can help. From the boardroom to you, Voice America Business Network. You are tuned in to Fear is Negotiable, Business Survival Skills 101. If you have a question or comment about the program, please send us an email to info at riskpa.com. Again, that's info at riskpa.com. Or follow us on Twitter at Fear is Negotiable. Now back to the program. Hey, welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Pam Hill, uh, and I'm here with Dr. Jay Singh, and we are talking about violence risk assessment. Um, just quickly, Dr. Singh, is there a difference in predicting someone who's likely to commit sort of general violence? So, you know, uh, you insult me and I go and I smash in, you know, your headlight with a baseball bat versus mass violence. Do we have any kind of predictors of knowing the way that this may manifest? Sure. 
Sure. Uh, compared to the general population, incidents of mass violence really are exceptionally rare. Uh, this is a very important thing to, to take, in, uh, take into account. You know, some people would claim that their numbers are up, uh, but in actuality, when we take a look at the incidents of mass, uh, mass shootings, for example, uh, from 1980 through 2010, it's really been very stable, uh, according to criminologists. So uh, if we take a look at reviews of the media literature, what we see is that significantly more time is being spent talking about these on the air. And so because of that, there's a perception that we have a lot more of these than ever in the past. But when we take a look at the scientific evidence, it's really just not there. Uh, but due to the relatively small number of mass violent offenders, this is why it can be a challenge to really statistically compare them to generally violent offenders. Uh, that said, what we do know is, uh, kind of unsurprisingly, is that we see a general profile of kids who, for example, are young, uh, young people who are loners, they have a history of being bullied, really all the usual suspects when it comes to risk factors. But the problem is, is that for every one individual who goes on to commit a shooting spree, there are literally thousands and thousands more with that exact same background who don't. And what right. we know from the research literature is that if we take individuals and we put them into treatment that they don't actually need, then that actually increases their violence risk. So let's say that uh, as a response to something like Sandy Hook, let's say, that we tried to identify every individual diagnosed with, uh, let's say, Asperger's, for, in uh, for instance, or everyone who had a, a hard time in, in high school. I think that a lot of us, a lot of listeners, would raise their hands in terms of having a tough time in high school. Basically, what we could be doing is engineering incidents of violence by putting loads of kids or young people unnecessarily in risk management programs using just this risk factor information that we have on incidents of mass violence. Interesting. It's why you can't take the, the judgment out of it, <laughs> of the you know, Absolutely. clinician doing, doing the evaluation. Super important. Um, how can the risk assessment process be improved? Well, what I would say is that there's really three keys here, and this is actually the reason why I moved back to the United States, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the first is that it's of the utmost importance that clinicians, regardless of whether you're a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a nurse, social worker, a uh, family therapist, a uh, counselor, that you be reading the risk assessment literature. This is something where all of our professional guidelines say uh, that in order to fulfill legal obligations, we need to make sure that we can tell whether one of our clients is at risk of harming themselves or others. Uh, the big problem here is that unless you're affiliated with the university, it can be extremely difficult to stay up to date. Each one of these articles, and keep in mind there's 15 to 20 published uh, per month, uh, these studies typically are filled with statistical jargon. They can be very long. Uh, they're quite expensive. Uh, average price is between 40 to $50. So you're ending up spending uh, at least $600 a month just actually buying them, let alone up to 20, 25 hours reading these different pieces. Uh, so what we've done, the reason I moved back to the States, was to be able to start an institute. So this is our Global Institute of Forensic Research, where that's exactly what we do. We provide a synthesis of the literature every single month, and every article, no matter whether it's five pages or 500 pages, is synthesized down to a single summary, highlighting the clinical implications with no statistical jargon whatsoever. We also offer things like exclusive interviews and trainings. And that's the second key, is being frequently trained. Uh, if you have been trained in violence risk assessment in the past, fantastic. Unfortunately, what we know is that as the years go on, three years is kind of the hot spot. If it's been three years since your last violence risk assessment training, any of the benefits that you would have seen from getting trained in this process uh, begin to go away. So it's important that facilities and also individuals in private practice have a way of staying up to date on this literature. And finally, it's to actually hear from experts themselves uh, so this is one of the things that we specialize in at the Global Institute is making sure that we make available to people uh, interviews with really the leading figures in this field to be able to get tips and tricks on things like forensic assessment. Now, are those things available to other professional mental health professionals or are those things that are available to lay people or, or business executives? Oh, absolutely. No, lay people, business executives, professionals, anyone can simply log on to our site, subscribe, and get that information every single month. 
And in terms of just the assessment itself, so someone has, um, you know, an employee that's escalating, they're starting to get really worried about it, they're, you know, harassing somebody else at the office or something like that. When do they bring in a professional, um, you know, someone like you that has professional experience? Because I, w- I wouldn't think you could go out and just find a psychologist that can do a risk assessment. That's a skill. Sure. You know, I think that it's it's very understandable that if uh, if an employer so uh, now having the experience which I never thought I would I would have of, of being a CEO is something where having employees you know it's something that of course always is uh, somewhere in your mind of wanting to take care of them and make sure that that everything is well and that you have a very nurturing workplace environment and when something seems to be going wrong or perhaps you have an employee where you're you're just a little bit worried given some evidence uh, that you've maybe seen or heard of it's completely understandable to want to evaluate their violence risk uh, one of course needs to be careful how they do this and as i said there really is clinical discretion is necessary uh, there are certainly individuals uh, who can do this for you though um, some are called threat assessment professionals. I'm someone you can always hire. Uh, there's definitely consultants who are out there. Well, this, this is what they do for a living. Uh, this is really their specialty. Uh, now, you, of course, can find someone who, let's say, doubles as, uh, as an expert witness, for example, in court. Um, but basically, in your area, there will be individuals who either uh, will be available to you to be able to hire on a consultancy basis. But it should be kept in mind that when it comes to violence risk assessment, that different people have different expertise. So just because someone says that they're an expert in a violence risk assessment, it could be with offenders, it could be with psychiatric populations, it may not be in workplaces. So what I would say is that I would definitely advise against uh, anyone without formal training in risk assessment from conducting these kinds of evaluations, uh, be it in the workplace or anywhere else, uh, because of these even simple decisions uh, requiring clinical discretion. That said, in terms of tools that you might want to ask a professional about, uh, if you want to focus on the culture of your workplace itself, uh, then you're best suited for an instrument. Uh, There's one called the WVR, uh, sorry, WRA20, the Workplace Risk Assessment 20, versus if you want to focus on employees themselves, then you're best suited for a tool like uh, there's one called the uh, Employee Risk Assessment 20, and both of these are by uh, Bloom and colleagues. And there are dozens of other instruments, though, uh, that are out there, both published as well as ones that workplaces have just kind of come up with themselves as protocols. Uh, You want to make sure that you have something that's been empirically validated, though. Uh, Don't come up with your own checklist. It's ill-advised unless you're going to empirically test it. Uh, You want to make sure that it's something that's reliable, meaning that if the person who comes in to do your evaluation for you, if they conduct the evaluation, then you call someone for a second opinion, that you're going to get the same finding. And this is where the research literature comes in on helping you to establish what is accurate versus not, what is reliable versus not. And by incorporating this kind of information, you're going to be a lot more effective at being able to pick a tool that is best suited for your needs that is also predicting the outcome that you care most about. Really interesting stuff. And I always tell all of my clients, just hire somebody <laughs> who knows how to sure. do this because of the society that we live in. You know, what, what happens if something did happen? I mean, just, uh, you know, just the liability of that is just, uh, you know, mind boggling to me. Um, just very quickly, we only have about a minute here, but is there a specific relationship between gun violence and mental illness? Is that sort of the go-to? Sure. I think that that's really a, a big question right now. And there's a tremendous amount of work that's being done these days to be able to establish some solid numbers. Uh, I would say that at the end of the day, if, if we simply, at, at the end of the day, the big question is, if we got rid of mental illness, what would we see happen to gun violence? That's really the key. And yeah. if we got rid of mental illness, we would still see the overwhelming preponderance of evidence being that uh, these numbers are not really going to go down substantially. Would they go down a little? The likelihood is yes. Would they go down to 50% of what they are today? No. And at yeah. the same time, what we see is that between 1993 and 2010, we have seen a 39% decrease in the number of firearm-related homicides. So we talk quite a bit about, you know, uh, firearm violence being an issue, and it's certainly not to say that it's not. But if we take a look at the raw numbers and prevalence, it seems to be something that at least we have a better handle on now than we have in the past. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Why don't you tell people how they can uh, learn more about your institution that you've set up, your research 
Absolutely. So in addition to the research uh, risk assessment digest that I, I recommended, definitely highly recommend you send, signing up for that. You can get all of this at our website, which is www.gifrinc.com. That's gifrinc.com. And I routinely also offer in-person workshops and consultancy on a number of topics relating to violence, sex offender and recidivism risk assessment, how to publish academic papers and peer-reviewed journals, and just statistical analysis. And you can always okay. feel free to contact me. Uh, okay, great. Well. And they can get a hold of me as well, and I can give them your contact information. Thank you so much, Dr. Sure. Singh. I hope you'll consider coming back. This is fascinating. Um, thanks to the listeners. Uh, next week, Robert Rangel will be back talking about his newest book, The Red Dot Club, on law enforcement shot in the line of duty. Until then, remember that fear is negotiable, but only through planning, training, and preparation. There is no other way. Until then, safe travels, everyone. Thank you for joining us this week for Fear is Negotiable, Business Survival Skills 101. We hope you'll tune in again next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time for another edition with host Pamela Hill on the Voice America Business Channel. We'll identify more of the best practices in business survival then. The information and ideas presented on this show are for informational purposes only. Please consult a business continuity, security, or disaster recovery professional before implementing.